So I'm from Chicago, and uh, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite surgeries, but one of my least favorite topics, which is complications, just like the last speech. And I want to thank um, my co-authors because allowing me to present some of their complications in an honest way. So we discussed T-lip in one of the earlier talks, and the T-lip that we do in Chicago at our institution is very similar to the one that Dr. Ku had presented, basically putting the screws in first on one side, then putting the inner body cage in, putting the screws on the opposite side, collapsing down on that inner body space, getting a reduction, and then really tightening those screws down so you have uh, less subsidence, making sure the inner body graft does not move. And the T-lift has been articulated well in the literature. Uh, decreased blood loss, going out of the hospital, shorter days, decreased uh, time to getting out of the hospital and going to um, rehab, and ambulation early, day one, day two. But complications are not well discussed for open TLIF or MIS TLIF. This is a paper that came out two years ago. It's actually a very large series, greater than 500 patients. And I wanted to emphasize this because I'm going to present our series, which is basically 513 patients, this is 530 patients, compare them side to side. MIS TLIF is a new technique, but it's not that new. We've had it around for 10 years. And the learning curve for surgeons is getting to the point where surgeons have done more and more cases. And open TLIF, we would expect, would have more literature on complications. However, this is the largest series. Here you can see that they did 300 patients were one level, 200 were multi-level operations, 14% durotomy, three patients went back to the OR, 4% infection rate, and those are the two complications that occur most of TLIF, both MIS and open and 2% screw misplacement with symptoms requiring reoperation. Complications were increased as you would expect with previous surgery and multi-level operations. And there are these other odd complications, cage migration, 2% retroperitoneal injury, and two patients with deficit. They went back and um, you can see here, this is meta-analysis, they added the other papers in the literature. The other series, 119 patients, 111, these are the largest patient series in the literature. Dr. Koo presented a paper earlier that's uh, probably now the largest of these, uh, 200 patients and showed complications. But you can see the rate of durotomy and infection, 4%, 4.8%, 3%. And these are the two largest complications. So we went back and looked at a decade's worth of patients at Northwestern, four surgeons, and these were one and two level operations, all minimally invasive. Uh, they are either revisions or virgin cases. And um, we excluded patients along constructs, trauma, PLIF, ALIF. These are the demographics, basically female, male, 60% to 40%. Most common, degenerative disc disease, spondylolisthesis, L4-5, L5-S1, and two levels, as you'd expect. And then single-level fusion was 84% uh, of the cases. So these are our results. 55 patients had at least one complication. 26 had more than one complication. But medical complications were quite rare. rare. These were much less than the open series. Only seven patients with DVTs, PEs, urinary retention, almost seven patients, and ileus, four patients. Majority of the patients left the hospital in less than three days, and the average time is two and a half days. These are our complications. So four patients had weakness. This is permanent weakness, less than 1%. Three patients with transient radiculopathy, four, uh, two with hematoma, 26 with durotomy, which was 5%, somewhat similar but lower than the open series. Wound infection, only three patients. K-wire fracture, idiosyncratic to MIS approach, six. Inner body exclusion, three. So I'm going to go through each of these complications, discuss basically our worst complications and uh, why we had them and how we've tried to prevent these complications from occurring again. So we had four patients who had neurological complication after the operation who woke up with some form of weakness. The average age was 65 years of age. Three of the patients had a grade one spondylolisthesis, one of the grade two. And we went back and we looked at the different risk factors. We tried to figure out why this occurred. Three of the four, uh, four patients had abdominal surgery, and uniquely all the patients were at L4-5 on the left side. And three of the patients lost SFCPs after the cage placement within 10 to 15 minutes after placement. And one patient lost signals actually at the beginning of the case. The um, MIS TLIF complication, as I said, was uh, less than 1%. This is the first of uh, those patients, 75-year-old with L5 radiculopathy, grade 1 spondy. She moved on her films uh, 2 millimeters, and she had a history of uh, renal cancer and colon cancer. 
and she lost SSAPs um, bilaterally after insertion of a 10 millimeter trial. A smaller cage was then chosen. We went down to an 8 millimeter cage, and then the M MEPs began returning following placement. CT and MRI after showed uh, the canal was free. There was no hematoma, no compressive lesion whatsoever, and there was good cage placement, and then no breach of the pedicles with the screws. She was five out of five before the operation. She woke up three out of five bilaterally. So all of our patients, we went back and looked. All of them actually had bilateral deficits. None were unilateral. In the operating room, there was very good exposure, good facetectomy. Uh, medical history was quite significant in three of the patients. Medical history included abdominal surgery, vasculopathy, and other disease. And as stated, some of the cages were larger than others. Some were a 10 millimeter cage in two of the patients, but one patient had this with an eight millimeter cage, and they're all approaching from the left side at L45. And they all had very similar changes on the neuromonitoring. And we reacted to the neuromonitoring changes. If something happened that uh, occurred after the placement of a trial, for instance, a 10 millimeter cage uh, trial, we went down to a nine or an eight. And the, e even with the placement and the MEPs coming back, patients had weakness. So we're still trying to figure out exactly why these cases occur. We went back and looked, as I said, and we still don't know. We have multiple possible etiologies. Stretch injury was one of the possibilities. The, the weakness after was bilateral on all the patients, and they all had larger cages. Potentially vascular, this is one part of our um, differential for this. Left-sided, L4-5, this is where some of the vasculature occurs. And they all had spondylolisthesis of at least grade one. The other complication is graft extrusion. This was actually quite low. The open series that I showed earlier had 10 patients, and still in 500 in the series, we had three cases. This is uh, one of the cases of my colleagues, 51-year-old. This is a um, larger patient, like John Mark had showed, one of the Dakini models, uh, who had a bilateral L1, uh, S1 radiculopathy. And she had a cage that was placed quite well in the operating room, uh, maybe slightly superficial with the back end two-day hospital stay, but she started ambulating uh, first week and second week. Four months post-op, she had a new mild radiculopathy and the cage had moved backwards. Uh, the surgeon on this case had said that the exposure was difficult and there was not much time placed on the discectomy and a smaller case was cage was placed and this is potentially the etiology of that cage moving back over time. And you can see here a potential avoidance as well-sized graft, compressing the screws at the end of the case having good disc removal and preparation of the end plates. So radiculopathy was actually quite rare. We had very few screw breaches, even using the MIS approach, and it was quite a rare event. 4% uh, of the screws breached. Uh, we went back and looked at CT scans uh, on all the pedicle screws, and the actual the area where it breached was medial more than uh, any other site. Uh, cranial caudal was very low, um, but medial to lateral was actually 10 to 1. And our thought on this was that when you're placing a screw in an MIS fashion, you're looking first at that bullseye view with the AP, and once you go and you're actually pushing the screw down into the pedicle, you're actually not looking at that AP view again. You're looking at cranial caudal, and you do not know how much you're medializing. Uh, we try to medialize our screws as best as we can to get good purchase, and we're starting out lateral. If you can't see that medial wall, you have to put it together in your mind, and this is where we're basically missing our screws. And you can see at the top left, that's one of our worst misses there. That's not in the pedicle at all. Um, and then that one in the middle and the one on the right, you can see this is to medial starting point, and obviously the other was a straight up and down, more of a bullseye approach. Now, we obviously have a lot of good screws that we could show, but these are the ones where we miss. These are the ones where we made the error and we try to learn from these errors. But this doesn't mean that the MIS approach actually is not good for placing screws. The open approach actually also has many misses. You can see these are the open series. This 2007 paper, 13%, just using anatomical landmarks. When you add flora, it went to 5%. This is still higher than our rate. Uh, the 2007 series, 10% with open T-lift. And then a large deformity series with freehand screws, 2%, uh, which is a quite good rate. Um, our avoidance basically is using 2D fluoroscopy, using the AP and lateral view, and being very careful about the placement, watching the medial side of the pedicle, um, and then also if you need to take extra shots, doing so. Uh, the O-arm fluoroscopy is also another technique, and one of my colleagues uses that uh, because he doesn't feel as comfortable with the AP view and looking down that pedicle and seeing that medial wall. 
hematoma, also very rare, only two patients. Uh, this is a 52-year-old, had a very um, textbook case, no problems, lasted about an hour and a half, 100 cc's of EBL, but on post-up day two, had new leg weakness. The surgeon on this case had discussed it with me and said they had a small uh, area of oozing down in the disc base. They just let it be because they didn't have much blood loss during the operation, but it's an enclosed space in MIS. Um, I'm more careful in the MIS cases with blood loss than the open cases because I'm watching every single small bleeder because I don't want that enclosed space to fill with blood. The um, idiosyncratic complication for MIS is if you're using K-wires is hardware breakage. Uh, you obviously could have this in open with larger pieces of equipment, but a K-wire is something that can break quite, quite easily. Uh, we had 1% of our patients having this. The other things that can break are inserter tips, jam sheeting needles, in addition to K-wires, but we've only had the K-wires break. Um, the avoidance potentially could be using an O-arm. One of my colleagues does that, uh, using K-wire free techniques, which I know exist. Uh, we use K-wires, I like them, but that's one way to avoid it. Uh, the other is actually to make sure that if a K-wire bends or gets damaged at any point, taking it out immediately uh, and replacing it. The other is using nitinol wires, which I've transitioned to myself, and blunt tip wires. There's very few reasons to have a sharp wire. It's basically you put the jam sheety down where you need it to be. You can replace it with a K-wire, take the jam sheety out, and you don't have to advance it. The other is never overriding the wire. If you get down to a very small segment of wire, putting the tap down to that small segment, that's where it can break off. And these are some of our cases. That's our first case on the right. Case number two, you can see a very small tip, all in bone. Case number three, another small tip, mostly in bone, coming out. Case number four, this one got outside of the bone, very small tip, no deficit, no problem. Case number five, very similar to case number three, mostly in bone and a small segment that's out. One thing you can see is these all broke the insertion of another instrument after it's already been there, putting a tap down, putting a screw down over the top of this. And they're all very small segments. You can see back, they're all about almost the exact same length, about four or five millimeters. And then that's where if you override the K-wire, that's where you can break it. And it's definitely after it's been used a couple of times. So one of my colleagues doesn't use K-wires. This is the technique. If you want to do MIS surgery for T-lifts, you don't need to use K-wire, so if you feel comfortable using an O-arm or have an O-arm at your hospital, you can use this. This is a technique he basically puts down his um, uh, guidance first, and then he makes two incisions four centimeters off midline, and he works down in two retractors bilaterally and does this in a mini open fashion and places the screws. He gets great results. So co last complication is CSF leaks. This is the most common complication of um, both the series, the open or the MIS, 26 cases. We went back and we looked and we tried to figure out maybe there's a part of the operation where we get that CSF leak. Uh, we went re resection of the flavum, bony resection, discectomy, all pretty similar. So throughout the entire operation, you can get that CSF leak less likely with the cage, but we didn't find really a trend where we were gonna be able to protect ourselves. Most important thing though, was that with the MIS technique, we didn't take a single patient back to the OR. No patient had a lumbar drain. No patient had a blood patch. And that's not the case even with the surgeons who do open t lift at our, at our institution or the other series. The CSF leaks had a consequence. Here, because that dead space is closed, we haven't had to take anyone back. We went back and looked at non-instrumented cases in the lumbar spine and found the same result. So in over 800 patients with an MIS lumbar procedure, none had to go back to the OR because of a CSF leak because of that potential space. Potentially it was smaller and there was less of a likelihood that it would get through the skin. So we looked also at what are the risk factors for complication. Prior operation and durotomy were increased in patients who had a previous operation. But the number one risk for infection was having a previous procedure. And then also multi-level op operations were much more likely to have a complication. So all techniques have a learning curve. You go back in the 1990s, you look at cholecystectomy, you look at MIS general surgery, um, lap coles, all these things basically went through the same learning curve that we're going through. And you can see these headlines talking about efficacy, talking about safety, and the learning curve for surgeons, the, the operative time, blood loss goes down with each procedure. Two series, one, uh, this is out of San Francisco, looked at the first 10 T-lifts. 
OR time and blood loss was already better with the MIS approach. Days with drains significantly improved and time to ambulation significantly improved. And the complication rate was slightly higher in the first 10 patients. Another series, 33 cases, the first 33 versus the next 32. Surgical time significantly improved with every operation and the complication rate was similar. And we looked at our own learning curve to see if we had these same effects. And we actually found that there was not much of a trend. Um, actually, the first 10, 15 cases for three of the surgeons here was actually the, without many complications. They had a few more complications in the 30 to 60 case number, and then it started to trend downwards. So there did not seem to be uh, any correlation between the time of doing the operation and when um, you had a complication. So TLIF, MIS approach, not thoroughly documented. Complications are rarely discussed in the literature. We don't have many series. This is one of the larger series for TLIF complications. Medical and surgical complications are infrequent, and it compares well with uh, open series, actually improved results. We do have some unique complications like K-wire fractures. There's rare neurological complications. They occur with open and MIS procedures, and these are in patients with high-grade um, spondees and comorbid states. And CSF leaks are less frequent. Um, also, the morbidity of the CSF leak is decreased because potential dead space is closed in MIS. Great, thank you very much.